of a shadow of the wings. We find our rest in you under the shadow.
believe tonight there's a real opportunity to throw our attention towards him in a unique way. So we're going to do that for a moment more tonight instead of just rushing into the next thing. I feel a unique grace to throw our attention towards him in a unique way. Amen. So would you just lift your hands and lift your voice all over the room as the musicians play and just let a recalibration happen in your focus tonight. How central can you bring Jesus into your world right now? And can you receive the invitation as he invites you into his world? Let there be a great exchange tonight. Come on, lift those hands. As you do, lift your voice all over the room. Woo! We only have eyes for you tonight. We only have eyes for you tonight.
do believe this is helping identify some of the grace that we're stepping into tonight. This opening up and to the measure with which we will embrace the grace to open up. That's where we receive the grace not to hold anything back. It's impossible for me to give anything to you like this. The word for the posture in Hebrew is toda. Toda rabah would be thank you very much. So there's a thank you in this. There's a uh, eucharistos, the word in the Greek, where we get the word eucharist. That literally means to come into such an ecstatic state of thanksgiving that you don't want to keep anything for yourself. But this is the enemy of this. And if you still think you need to protect yourself, if you still think you're responsible for your well-being, then you'll intrinsically stay in this posture. But if you can let this presence we're in tonight do more than make the hair stand up on the back of your neck if you see it as an infusion of grace you'll be able to open up again maybe you opened up in the past and it didn't turn out well that wasn't now that was then and don't let then keep you from what you're being in invited into now so we're going to go one more time and i want you to just hold your hands out in the position of toda all over this room joining us by live stream just open up open up open up you ancient gates be lifted up you everlasting doors that the king of glory may come in who is this king of glory come on stretch him out We release grace upon grace. Grace upon grace.
those hands high once again tonight. You are the ancient gates. Stretch them high. Would you do that, Lord? We just thank you tonight. It's a joy to be where you are, Lord. It's a joy to be where you are with people who honor that you're here, Lord. Thank you. Whew. Our hearts are filled with gratitude. We would never take for granted the greatness of what you've allowed us to be a part of carry with us the sense that we're only just beginning step into the fullness of all that you have designed we bless you this night the awesome name of Yeshua can you say yes come on why don't you turn around and greet a few people high five them tell them welcome glad that they're here so glad you're here tonight find a seat. Hey, listen, if you will kind of move up and in, uh, you don't need a chair between you and your wife. You all need to figure that out at a home and come in here ready to sit by each other. So we got a lot of people standing in the back. We got people uh, overflowing out into the lobby. And I know we'd like to get as many people in the room as we possibly can. We added a bunch of more chairs over here. Uh, matter of fact, you can sort of ignore the reserve signs up here on the front and come sit by Miss Teresa and um, get some of that on you if you feel like you can stand it. So, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to let the worship team be seated. They certainly put their effort in tonight. So thank you guys so much. Are you grateful for this team the Lord's given us? Elijah, Elijah Ward, still not back, should be back this coming week. He's a... Uh, helping take care of the kiddos while Macy's on bed rest because uh, she gave birth to a sumo wrestler. If you've not seen the pictures of him, he is probably going to be hitting the tour sumo wrestling very soon. So uh, we're just thankful to have a little merit here with us. And uh, CJ, thank you for jumping in there tonight. CJ England, thank you, buddy. Wherever that gift distribution line is, my family did not get in it. And apparently the England's doubled up because they can all do all this. Anything up here, they can pick up a chair and make music come out of it. It's ridiculous. 
So we're thankful for him jumping in with us while Elijah is uh, helping Macy recover and helping uh, those baby girls get used to new baby brother. So we're going to get ready to receive the offering tonight. Are you stirred about being able to give into the kingdom? We certainly have some amazing things going on. If you have, if you have parked down there, which I'm sure you did, you need to know that we will be very soon doubling the size of our parking lot. We're having all new dirt brought in, all new gravel. So we'll be doubling the parking pad right here out in front of the church. We'll still have to use the overflow, but, but it will at least give us the ability to put another 50 or so cars right here on the main pad. And uh, we're honored, to be able to, excited to be able to do that. We poured an additional pad for the basketball so that we have full court basketball now so that we can maybe actually get exercise when we play basketball. That'd be the only reason anybody would ever play basketball be for exercise. Uh, and it gives Coach Taylor the ability to have one team playing on one goal, one team playing on the other. The other surprise thing that I'm going to do is I'm getting a quote this week on having it striped for pickleball. So we're going to turn that also into a pickleball court for those of you that can't play tennis but you're a little bit more advanced than ping pong. There's a sport been created for you called pickleball. And uh, we're going to stripe that pickleball court out there, and we'll have a net that can be removed, and then we'll be able to play some pickleball out there as well. So lot, lots going on, and your giving is helping make all of that happen. But way more importantly than that, your giving is funding the fulfillment of prophecy. And again, I'm going to say this again. I'll tell you why I was going to say this. I wasn't going to talk about this tonight. Matter of fact, I was going to have Matt Putman take up the offering because apparently he didn't do enough tonight. I was just going to have him do that as well. But I, I, uh, I very rarely um, see what people give, but a very substantial check was given here recently. And Jordan, our CFO here, felt like I needed to see what was written in the memo. And written in the memo of the check, large check that we just received was this, funding the fulfillment of prophecy. Isn't that incredible? And I thought this, you know, and, and where that comes from is the wise men came bringing massive treasure chests filled with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When they brought that, they fell down at Yeshua's feet. They worshiped him. They gave him treasure chests filled with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And as a result of that, they were able to fulfill the word of the Lord from the angel that said, now go to Egypt. So it was time for them to leave and go to Egypt, and they didn't have to worry about how they were going to fulfill that mission. And the importance of going to Egypt was the prophecy of Isaiah was that a messianic deliverer would come out of Egypt. And so that prophecy was fulfilled through wisdom's generosity. Now, I know you've heard this before, but I want you to catch it. I want you to catch it the way those people called it that wrote that check that what wisdom looks to do is find where God's moving and be a part of that legacy by connecting financially. And so I'm praying that's what you're doing tonight. I'm so thankful for your faithfulness and giving. We don't come to you with any needs. We don't have any needs. We've got abundance. We've got surplus. God is good. He's moving. We're managing those resources by the grace of God, by the help of the Holy Spirit. And yet we know that we are being prepared to take possession of the adjoining land. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm right now have spent some time this past week uh, looking into some building plans. And I think I've got a building plan for a new sanctuary. Give us the ability to seat about 1,800 people and give us the ability to really grow and kind of triple what we're doing here right now. Um, I've never wanted to have a big church. I'm not necessarily want to have a big church right now, but I also don't want a place where there were more people who could be exposed to what the Lord's doing and they're not able to because we don't have the space. So we definitely have the land. Thank God for those that went before us that made a way for that to happen, and we'll be able to put a building out here on the property, and that would give this building the ability to be exclusively used for the school and Union University. We have over 130 applicants for Union University right now. We can't put 130 more people in here. We can't grow the church by 130 people. Less than 10% of those that are signed up come to the church currently. So you're talking about a map. Now, we're not going to take 130 people by any means. I'm, I mean, this is going to be fine-tooth comb. This is like picking special forces operatives. This ain't like going into the National Guard. 
No offense to our National Guard people. I'm sure you did a great job. But this is more like the elite of the elite of the first group we're going to pick. So, but we are, we are growing. We're expanding. And we're thankful for your giving to help us do that. And I have over my life tried to connect to places where prophecy was being fulfilled. And the more I learn to grow in wisdom, the more I look for opportunities to say, that's going to change the earth and I want some skin in the game. Amen. That is changing the earth and I want some skin in the game. Here's my number one thing. It's changing me and I want some skin in the game. Amen. So if you want, if you're going to give with us tonight, you can take your smartphone out. You can scan that QR code on the screen for your giving. This offering goes exclusively to the homestead of Mobile. QR code is the easiest way for you to give, but if you're like me, you want to fill out an offering envelope, they're in the seat back pockets in front of you. If you want to give by cash or credit card, if you're making out a check, please make the check payable to the Homestead Mobile, the Homestead Mobile. If you're watching us on live stream, first of all, we love you. We always want to take the time to bless and let our local congregation here know, it's kind of probably not a good word to describe what we have going here, but we're familiar with it. This crazy group of people who lives here know that everything we're doing would not be able to happen without the faithfulness of those that we call the Cosmic Homestead. So would you guys say thank you to the faithfulness of the Cosmic Homestead. We love you. We have people in, on, living on other continents who set their alarm at 2 o'clock in the morning because that's what time this comes on where they are. And they get up out of bed and they fix a cup of coffee and they start their day by watching this as their church. Just, just we get reports constantly from people all over the world, from Ireland, from Scotland, from Africa, you name it, from the Middle East, a lot from the Middle East of people that are really being touched by what the Lord's doing and the message the Lord's given us to steward. So all the announcements for the month will be on the screen for you to view before and after the service. Are you ready to give? All right, Father, I thank you that you're increasing your people indeed. That you've never called anybody to do anything and not given them the resources to make it happen. So every dream you've placed inside of every dreamer, I declare the resources for those dreams are coming to pass. I speak over businesses that have started and that are going to start, and I say supernatural increase is upon you. The favor of the Lord has kissed the work of your hands, and now you are beginning to increase indeed. I speak new contracts. Thank you, Lord. I speak expansion, that you're going to hire crews. Some of you are going to be able to give your life more to prayer because you're going to be able to hire crews to do things you used to have to do yourself. Your increase will not come in the days to come by the sweat of your brow, but it'll come by way of the inheritance of the living God. I speak more and more favor upon you. Every idea, every invention, and every dream be fueled by the fire of the perfect love of God as you step into a realm where there is no risk because perfect love has cast out all fear. And you have no more anticipation of failure. You are planning on increase to the glory of God. Can you say yes? yes? All right, ushers, you can wait on the folks. Pass those buckets around. No way to overemphasize the significance of the week we're about to step into. But we have around 500 leaders that are going to be coming from all over the country and some from out of the country to be with us for Tuesday morning. Sorry, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, and Wednesday night. Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Wednesday night. Then we will kick into Thursday and Friday will be our reunion weekend services. When the Lord spoke those dates to me, I knew they were leading up to Good Friday, but I hadn't wrapped my heart fully around the idea that we're going to be in here pretty much every day during Holy Week. That this is the most significant week of the year on the liturgical calendar. Sunday kicking off Palm Sunday, then we go into Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, Holy Wednesday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then ultimately Easter. So we're going to be engaging during a significant season, and I think it's so interesting that we'll have church, you know, at least six times during that particular span of time, seven if you count tonight over the week. And so we're just really stirred about what the Father is going to be doing and where people are going to be being invited into. If you are a part of our local community here, specifically on the Thursday and Friday night, if you want to get in the main sanctuary, I would get here really early 
Thursday and Friday and go ahead and find a spot. If not, you may end up in the overflow, which is fine. We've seen some amazing miracles happen in overflow tents and overflow rooms and overflow buildings, and we'll have over 100 seats set up upstairs for people for overflow. But whenever you've got the under the Oaks leadership gathering, you, you typically have around half of those that stay. Uh, many of them have to get back because of their leadership responsibilities. But even if, even if 25% of them stay and then we have a reunion weekend, we're going we're gonna to be really crowded. So you may want to get here a little bit early. Let me also say for our Under the Oaks gathering, which again is Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, then we're going to eat Dreamland barbecue because I, when I lived in South Carolina, I told the Lord, if I have the opportunity to expose these people to something besides this unbelievably crappy South Carolina barbecue, it's completely freaking disgusting. They make the sauce with vinegar. What kind of demon possessed a man to put vinegar and mustard in barbecue sauce? People, it's ketchup and sugar that you make barbecue sauce from. You can throw some syrup in there if you want to, but you sure as blank don't need to put vinegar in there. I'm going to get offended. So we're going to feed all of them Dreamland barbecue. Dreamland, man, I'm, listen, support Dreamland. They are so good to us, you have no idea what they do for us. They called and said, we're doing it cheaper. And we're going we're gonna to discount the meat, and we're going to discount the sides. And, we're, and they bring us food to feed about twice the amount of people that we actually need to feed. They're awesome. They have really, really been good to us. So support them. Let me say, if you're coming to Under the Oaks, 18 years of old and older. So please don't call and ask because you can't find a babysitter if you can bring your kid. We just cannot do that. We never did it. It's very important that we keep that an adult only gathering. Even if you have an 18-year-old that acts like a 12-year-old, you can leave them home too. So we wanted to have a real specific audience and be very mature. And I won't feel as bad about cussing and stuff if we've got an 18 and older. That's kind of the R. We can have R-rated church. Hallelujah. All right. I might be kidding about that. I don't know. I'm not sure. So let's go. Let's jump in together. I'm going to read some things I've been writing. I've been away. Uh, and Tammy and Judah and I went on a little trip to the beach. Um, felt like I needed to celebrate a spiritual anniversary and then also really prepare for what was coming in the week ahead. So we spent a lot of beach time because Jesus chose to live on the beach because that's where wisdom wants to live. And um, so we, I'm thankful. I told Tammy, I said, I'm thankful that we have beach kids. I'm just thankful. I'm just thankful. I appreciate that my kids like to go lay in the sand and get sandy and jump in the ocean. As soon as they got there, they both run out there and just, uh, I said, both of our kids. Oh, okay. Sorry. Elijah. Elijah went too. He, first of all, he tried not to. He was going to make all of us go without it. Maybe that's why I left you out right there. All right, so, yeah, but all of my children went, both of them, both of them went, and uh, Judah didn't want to come home. We were in a really cool city, and anytime Judah gets in a really cool city, he says, I think this is where I belong. So you mean not Mobile? We love Mobile, but Mobile's not real cool. So, um, yeah, it's, that's right, yeah, it's getting there, it's getting there. All right, let me read this to you tonight as we get started and uh, we're going to go to Romans 8. So go ahead and turn over to Romans 8. I'm going to look at Romans 8, 17 through 21. We're going to do a little bit of a hybrid tonight as we talk more about glorification and theosis. We're going to talk a little bit more about our responsibility regarding stewarding the new creation, stewarding the new creation. And as we steward the new creation, we understand that's being fueled by our ability to stand face to face with him. Okay. There we begin to uncover and recover our image, the image that was forfeited by Adam in the beginning. Are you ready? An appropriate thematic interpretation of Romans, and specifically Romans 8, is vitally important for this culture, talking about us, this culture as we move forward. So let me read that again. An appropriate thematic interpretation of Romans, and specifically Romans 8, is vitally important for this culture as we move forward. If you're new here, you would not know that this church was originally named The Rock. And there has been, over the years, no more important section of Scripture for laying the foundation of this house that we are now seeing this begin to come through than Romans 8, Romans 8 and John 17. And if you've heard me teach over the years, I use those a lot because I cut my teeth on those 
as my apostle led me to an understanding of the importance of John 17 and Romans 8. What does John 17 and Romans 8 have in common? They're both about your and I's ultimate intention, glorification. That the glory I have, John 17, 22, the glory that I have with them, I, the glory I have, I give the exact same glory to them. It's the John 17 decree. And then you move into Romans 8, and Romans 8 is all about glorification. Those who he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. Doxa. Doxazo is glorify or glorification, and glory is doxa. So it's literally a sharing, listen to this, of splendor. It is one of the most overlooked things about Yeshua was his heart to share. That he did not hoard his fellowship with the Father in the Spirit. Hmm. That he said, I am the only son but I'll become the slain son to be the resurrected son so that I can be the firstborn heir over many multiplied brethren. So in the sharing of his life with us, he gave us more than his blood for the remission of sin. He gave us his blood so sin could be remitted, listen to this, so that image could be recovered. And as the image is recovered, we know that's a secondary consequence of fellowship being recovered. As fellowship and union are recovered, so is the image recovered. As the image is recovered, I want you to hear this, so is the intended rule of man over the cosmos. That's Romans 8, specifically getting in to verse 17 through about 21. Let me read this again. An appropriate thematic interpretation of Romans, and specifically Romans 8, is vitally important for this culture as we move forward. Unfortunately, Romans has been read, specifically in the West, as a book whose sole topic is about me and my salvation at worst, or us and our salvation at best. Do I need to read that again? Okay. Unfortunately, Romans has been read, specifically in the West, as a book whose sole topic is about me and my salvation at worst, or us and our salvation at best. The issue here is that our obsession with the legal aspects of the doctrine of salvation, soteriology is what we call that, the doctrine of salvation, has caused us to gouge out the very heart of Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to be shy about this tonight. What, I am, what I'm going to teach on tonight, thank you, Lord. My topic I gave you last week was this. How religion almost ruined Romans. Okay, so I want to be, I'm, I'm not shy about what I want to tell you has happened to this book and specifically this chapter. It's been said if, if, if Romans was the engagement ring of the New Testament, that Romans 8 is the diamond. How about that? Romans has been read specifically in the West as a book whose sole topic is about me and my salvation at worst or us and our salvation at best. The issue here is that our obsession with the legal aspects of the doctrine of salvation has caused us to gouge out the very heart of Paul's letter to the Romans. The heart of Romans, in my estimation, has far more to do with the justified man or better said, the righteous man entering into his intended glory as in those he made righteous he also glorified. Come on. The result of this metamorphosis is a cosmic liberation that permits the whole of the new creation to subsequently enter into its glory. And the final outworking of this is what Paul was aiming to awaken our consciousness regarding. Again, Romans and specifically Romans 8 is not about saved sinners going to heaven instead of hell when they die. As a matter of fact, Romans 8 does not mention heaven. Nowhere in the book of Romans does Paul ever talk about dying and going to heaven. As a matter of fact, I finished my study on Paul's correspondence. Nowhere in anything he ever wrote did he ever talk about dying and going to heaven. And we've made that the gospel. And we've certainly made that the glory. We've made glory a place you go to when you die. They went to glory. And glory is not a place. A place can be glorious, but glory is not a place. Oh, thank you, Lord. Romans, and specifically Romans 8, is not about saved sinners going to heaven instead of hell when they die. The Bible is promising so much more than post-mortem ecstasy, but rather the Bible is an invitation into the life of the Spirit. 
and our shared union with the Father, Son, and His Spirit. This is the life Yeshua called Zoe, and Zoe more abundantly. Romans 8 starts with no condemnation and ends with no separation. Romans 8 starts with no condemnation and ends with no separation. Where the accusing voice of the condemner has been silenced by the resurrection of the victorious lamb, there is no longer an assumption of separation, but a full, vital, and glorious access to the one whose face we discover is exactly like the Father. And as a secondary consequence, we discover the very image that we have been pre-designed to be conformed into. From here, the kingdoms of this world do indeed begin to become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. We're going to go into Romans 8. Let's look at, oh, let's look at. Verse 17, and then we may, we may dive back a little bit and, and, and pull some other things out of some of the earlier part of the letter. But let's, let's start in verse 17. Romans 8, verse 17. If you're reading out of a Passion Translation, there's a heading between verse 17 and 18 that says, A glorious destiny. That's indeed what 17 to 21 is about. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all his treasures. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. All that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him provided that we accept his suffering as our own. So what is the key to co-glorification? Understanding that he did not simply, listen to this, suffer substitutionally but he brought us with him in his suffering because he was suffering vicariously. We were living vicariously through his suffering. Paul words it like this. We will be co-glorified, listen to this, provided we accept his suffering as our own. Now, religion tried to turn that into suffering with him. Didn't it? you got to suffer the way that he suffered. Then why did he suffer? And the reason we have to suffer the way that he suffered is because we don't understand the mystery of our inclusion in the crucifixion. It, it, it requires too much mysticism for the Hellenistic mind to be able to understand that when he was there at Calvary, you were there at Calvary. You were buried in baptism with him. When we took you under the water, you mystically traveled back in time to the point that he was buried. And when you came up out of the water, you mystically traveled back in time. And as you come out of the water, he comes out of the tomb. And this is the mysticism that's necessary for us to understand what it it really means to be the righteousness of God in Christ. Many will balk at the idea of going that far down the road of mystery, and therefore they will make things that were meant to be supernaturally, experientially encountered, they'll begin to make them academic concepts. We'll become experts on doctrine. And I'm afraid of anybody who's absolutely secure in their doctrinal certitude. Your doctrine needs to be flexible enough for your theology to grow. And if you think you already have it all, then you need to ask yourself some honest questions that you've not had the integrity to ask, which is why do people not get healed when you pray for them? That's fair. I've asked myself that question in, at funerals many times, and I don't think any real leader with any integrity can say differently. If you've ever overseen or officiated a funeral of somebody that you love that died prematurely, you have to be asking yourself the question, what are we not getting here? And I don't trust people who don't ask that question. What are we not getting here? Instead of saying, well, you know, God needed another angel in his choir or flower for his garden. Bull scubula. Huh? No, man. You and I are to be co-glorified, and one of the reasons why we're not moving in the level of glory that we've been designed for is because we've not understand the fullness of the significance of our inclusion in the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement of Jesus. 
buried with Christ in baptism, to rise and walk again in the newness of life. And those he justified, he glorified, you and I, by way of the gift of righteousness, are supposed to be reigning in life. Come on, this is what Paul's talking about. Paul is talking about a group of people who come to an understanding that the enormity of what Jesus went through on the cross is to be experienced as our own suffering and therefore the glorification Jesus experienced based on what he was willing to go through at the cross also then becomes our same glorification. I can't be as righteous as him and not as royal. He's the king of kings. It doesn't make me not a king. It makes me a king with the ultimate king as my king. And what kind of king rules when he has the ultimate king as his king? Thank you, Lord. I feel a shaking in me tonight. We're fixing to host 500 leaders from all over the country that are hearing this and going, could that be true? And can I take the risk? Of reforming the gospel, recapturing and reforming the gospel. Thank you, Lord. I feel the holiness of the Lord in here. I'm telling you, I do. We will experience being co glorified with Him, provided that we accept His suffering as our own. Look at the footnote if you have a Passion Bible from Dr. Simmons of the H of 817. He says, If we suffer jointly, we will enjoy glory jointly. I am not seated with him until I believe I'm crucified with him. Paul said it like this. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. The life I now live, I live through, listen to this, the faith of the Son of God. Not faith in. The faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. The life I now live, I live through the faith of the Son of God. This is the problem. We've believed that we accessed grace by believing. And I believe we access believing by grace. Oh, get what I just said. That's nasty strong. That's what happens when you walk on the beach for three days. This is, no, this is it. This is what the Lord said. He said, you want people to have the right belief system so they can get hold of grace. And he said, nobody can believe right until they have first been gripped by grace. But if grace gets a hold of you, the secondary consequence of that is you will have faith and you will believe right, but you have to get there by way of grace. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, Christ that liveth in me, the life I now live, I live through the faith of the Son of God. Can you imagine having Son of God faith? Because I'm going to tell you, you'll never have Son of God glory until you first have Son of God faith. And you're never going to have Son of God faith until you understand the value of the doctrine of inclusion. That means you were included in the death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement. Paul would go on to say it like this in Ephesians. He would say, man, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, hath raised us up and seated us together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What? Boom. how, how, How did we get to sinners saved by grace when we were supposed to start at seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? I'm not just seated with him. I'm seated in him. Come on, come on. My relationship with God is not me with God. It's me in God and God in me. For John said, in that day you will know that I am in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. He actually said, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and my Father is in you as your Father, and your Father is in me as our Father. Hello? We need an elevation in our Christology. That's not going to happen unless we honor the pneumatology we're experiencing together as the Holy Spirit is pointing us to Jesus. For he does not come, the Spirit, to speak of himself. But he comes to bear witness of Yeshua. Spirit is used 19 times in the first 27 verses of Romans 8. The word spirit is used 22 times in Romans 8. 
Romans 8 is not about justification by faith. Just, Romans 8 is about walking in the Spirit. It's not about the doctrine of justification. It's about the lifestyle of pneuma. Oh, being of the wind, born from the wind, and becoming agents of the wind who allow themselves to, to demonstrate maturity, according to Dr. Simmons' translation, by being moved by the impulses of the Spirit. He says this. He says the mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Spirit. And we live in a culture that devalues being impulsive. But the fully mature man is the man who says, where are we going? The wind will tell us. Where are we going? The wind. Not where have we been before. Not where did other people go when they got here. But where is the wind saying to you and I, you're being invited into a measure of demonstration. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard. God, welcome to Friday night. Isn't this fun? I love this. Love what the Lord's teaching us. Provide, we get co-glorified, provided that we accept his suffering as our own. I am convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us. The entire universe is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin, hamartia. But now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay. And to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children to this day, we are aware of the universal agony and groaning of creation, as it were, in the contractions of labor for childbirth. And it's not just creation. We who have already experienced the awakening or the first fruits of the Spirit also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed for this is the hope of our salvation. So part of what I feel the Lord is saying do next, and this is how we're living right now. What do you want us to do next? And, and the temptation is to maybe for me to run on ahead into something I'm doing and walking in or being revealed to me personally and kind of miss putting the pieces together the way that we need to. I mean, ultimately, I want to get, get us to the place where I understand that uh, living peaceably with all men and showing love to people that are absolutely unlovable and learning to love our enemies will be what changes the world. But we got some work to do before we get there. Or we'll pretend that we love our enemies. We won't actually love our enemies. We'll just quit talking as bad about them as we used to. That's different than loving them. Right? So, so one of the pieces that I feel like we're being invited to engage with right now as a community who are involved in seeing the maturation of a culture, your involvement here is significant because your yes actually adds who you are to the equation of our culture. Your no if you're called to be here, retracts from a peace we're supposed to be inheriting by you fully investing your heart into the culture of what the Lord's doing here. So whether you ever touch a microphone, whether you ever play an instrument on a stage, you are moving the room based on your investment in the fullness of all the Father has invited you into. Your yes and a real yes and a deep yes, and let me say this because this can help some people. How about an enduring yes? can really help cause the watermark in the room to change. I can, I can fill the room with water by filling the room with a lot of water, or I can fill the room with water by filling it, the room with a lesser amount of water and using Archimedes' principle of displace, displacement and put 400 people in the room, and the water will go up because you're in it, not because there's more of it. And sometimes our cry for more has been because we wanted to make up for the fact that we didn't want to fully invest with our hearts. Many people will come to ride a place where there's a wave. Some jump in to such a measure that they actually make a wave. We had a wave pool when we were kids. It included a ladder and a diving board. And five of us would start jumping. And one would jump, can opener, rock the pool. Next one, cannonball, rock the pool, rock the pool. And you go and you get up the ladder as fast as you can, jump off the diving board. Get up the ladder as fast as you can, jump off the diving board. Get the Next thing you know, it's sloshing over the sides of the pool. And we are doing what we call rocking the pool. 
And, and this is what happens when you bring your worship in, and instead of waiting on it to reach the high note, instead of assessing whether it's your favorite song or not, but you just come in here so thankful that the Lord has allowed you to be a part of what's going on in the earth, that you come in with a can opener right off the bat into what the Lord's doing. And we begin to experience a measure of the move of the Spirit based on your passion, not their gifting. Remember the Ray Hughes dream. Don't worry about the stage. It's the water in the room that determines what happens with the stage. And so more and more, you and I are going to get the opportunity to understand the significance of the role we play. The atmosphere 500 leaders walks into here in a few days will have a lot to do with you. I'll be ready for my part. And they'll be ready for their part. But you carry a part in that you come in as the first fruits witness. This is what he said. He said creation's groaning, but not just creation. He said there's an initial group of awakened people that have a groaning on the inside of them to experience their full status as God's sons and daughters. Do you have that groaning in you? I don't believe you would have come to a place like this unless you had that groaning in you. And now the Father is providing you and I a place where the groan can begin to be released. Because here's the problem. The groan can't produce its intended fruit as long as it's capped. The groan has to be released. You never tell a woman in labor, quiet down, sister. You'll get hit with a right cross. Huh? Look like Muhammad Ali was throwing butterfly kisses compared to what you get hit with. Why? Because there's something in delivery where people need space to release the passion on the inside of them to reach their full status as God's beloved sons and daughters. So we have to create leaders are called, I'm in a lot of leadership mode, so just be patient with me tonight. Uh, Leaders are called to create atmospheres that permit an expression that's equal to what the people are born for. And not everybody knows what they were born for. But for those that do or, or are coming to an understanding of what they're born for, there has to be space for you to do more than, praise the Lord. What times, is it 12 yet? No, the, I mean, there, there's lots of places for that. I can recommend dozens without you having to burn any gas. I mean, just right around the corner. They're everywhere. This is Alabama. Right? There are plenty of places where you can go and ease your conscience about the nature of your compromised lifestyle every Sunday for an hour and a half. But then there have to be other places where people who say, when he touched me, my God, when he touched me, I knew he was marking me. I knew the encounter I was having with the living God was not about me dying and going to heaven one day. I knew the encounter I was having with the living God was about me becoming the fire of his eyes, looking into the culture and saying, you will be liberated from your slavery to decay. Oh, I feel it. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa. Religion almost ruined Romans. Why? Because religion makes everything forensic. Religion makes everything about legality. It's where we, why we call it legalism. Legalism. Okay? Most of the people in this room dealt with some measure of legalism. The first phase of you being invited into the life of the paraclete is to be delivered from the torture of the pedagogue. Pedagogue is the Greek word for law. Parakletos is the Greek word that's used to describe the Holy Spirit only by the Apostle John. Without the Apostle John, we never know the word paraclete, which is parakletos. We never know that word. All throughout Acts, we talk about the Spirit, we get pneuma. Reading Romans right here, we get pneuma. Paul understood the pneuma thing, but beloved identity understood the parakletos thing. Now, pneuma is a difficult word. I don't know. This is so far off what I plan on talking about, but whatever. Pneuma is a challenging word because pneuma can simply mean wind. Pneuma is a cool word. Um, If you have a wrench that works by air, it's called a pneumatic wrench. You ever watch a NASCAR race? You needed to drink beer and something to go along with that, you watched the NASCAR race. So while you were drinking Bud Heavies, you, you, you see the guy, 
and they don't change the tire with a wrench that you turn with manpower. They use air power. <laughs> hey, that was pretty good. <laughs> and they put, what they're doing is they're harnessing air to create torque. Come on, somebody. <laughs> to cause things that need to be unlocked to be unlocked so it can be replaced with something new. And so what you and I need to begin to understand about our revelation of pneuma, we are never dealing with a depersonalized force. The word pneuma literally has to do with personhood. It's not a generic wind, it's a spirit wind. And Paul wanted, I mean, John wanted us to know that by coming on later and saying, yes, the pneuma thing is fine, but you need to understand more than what the person of the Spirit does. You need to understand who the person of the Spirit is. Pneuma is what he does. Parakletos is who he is. And it's more than the one who's called alongside to help. That's a poor definition. Parakletos is literally the one in whom you become infused to be who it is you are designed to be. Paul said they need to know that. They don't just need to know because this is what happened to us. How many of us grew up when, when being talked, when the spirit was being talked about, the spirit was an it that got a hold of us to use us for his purposes? No, the spirit is a him that gets a hold of us to use us for his purposes. That when we make that shift, we make that big leap in our hearts, then we begin to move relationally into the understanding that Romans 8 is about how to get free from Romans 7. Romans 7 is Paul's pre-regenerated existence. Romans 7 is not Paul talking about what he's wrestling with as a man filled with the Spirit. Romans 7 is Paul talking about what he wrestled with before he was a man filled with the Spirit. Romans 7 and Romans 8 is not a picture of a duplicity of natures and us, and us learning to manage our sin consciousness like a man walking around with a dead body on his back. If you were taught that, it's wrong. Romans 7 is Paul saying, this is the futility of the man under the pedagogue, and this is the liberty of the man under the paraclete. So you see the, so this is what, this is what Paul is saying. Paul's saying, the law, um, let me say it like this. The law empowered the transgression. The law Few infused, because that's the spirit word, the law infused the sinful man with more understanding of his sinfulness. Oh, yes, it did. But the spirit, in the same way, infuses the man with more of the understanding of his righteousness. So the key to overcoming the part of you that wants to do what it's not supposed to do and the part that doesn't do what it is supposed to do, Romans 7, is learning to live the life of the Spirit. How do you learn to live the life of the Spirit? Well, let's just look at how Paul teaches it. You start with a foundation of zero condemnation in Christ. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thank God. Jesus Christ. There is, therefore, now no condemnation. To them that are in Christ Jesus. And he said, this is what happens. As long as you're under, listen, the influence of the pedagogue, there'll always be a sense of needing to focus on you being condemned, on you being guilty, on you being unrighteous. But when you come under the governmental rule of the Spirit, the governmental rule of the Spirit is emphasizing and highlighting your righteousness. Are, are, are you getting this? Am I saying this? Is this clear? Okay. Because this is important. Because it's there's therefore now no condemnation. Now, a poor insertion by an inferior translation went on to say, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. But that's not in any of the original. You can look at Dr. Simmons' footnotes if you'd like to. That's not in any of the original or most reliable Greek manuscripts. This part of who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit is an insertion. Okay, so it literally should have said this. There's therefore now no condemnation to them or in Christ Jesus for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. There's now, there's therefore now no condemnation and here's why. 
The word for there could have been translated because. And if you look at one through three, there are three becauses. There's therefore now no condemnation because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. No condemnation, absolute freedom, and complete liberty from bondage all in two verses. And that's the foundation of Romans 8. And he said, from here, are you with me tonight? From here, let's take a spirit walk. Now you can walk by the spirit, right? Because if the pedagogue has been dismissed from the camp, if Hagar and Ishmael got their exit papers, according to Galatians 4, then you and I are now living free from the intimidating, accusing voice telling us that we don't measure up. You're able to say, I don't have to measure up because I'm not being measured. Yeshua is the one being measured, and I am being measured according to the standard of Yeshua. And the thing that I've been teaching all over the country now for years is this. This is important. When a sin-burdened worshiper under an inferior covenant would bring a lamb before a priest, never under an inferior covenant did the priest ever examine the sin-burdened worshiper. They examined the lamb. Now, under a superior covenant, we don't have a, a, an inspection happening for us. We have an inspection happening of the lamb on our behalf. Come on. You are everything that you are designed to be because the lamb is perfect. You're predestined to be conformed to the image of the lamb because the lamb was perfect. They needed a perfect Israelite to fulfill the covenant. And Jesus said Abraham couldn't do it and Moses couldn't do it and David couldn't do it. But we had a plan before the foundation of the world that we would fulfill the covenant all by ourselves. So Yeshua comes down, takes both ends of the covenant, fulfills the God side and the man side because he's very God of very God and very man of very man. He said, I'll take over the whole thing. I'll take the sad man messed up and I'll become sin. <laughs> and I'll take the righteousness of God and I'll become the God man. And I'll tie both pieces together. And through the beauty of the dignity of perfect love, I will smuggle myself into man's dilemma and blow it up from the inside out with perfect love. Oh, man. Romans 8. Religion made it about people dying and going to heaven. Am I against people dying and going to heaven? Heck no. It beats the alternative. I'm going to tell you something, but that's about it. And I don't really want to be called in the intermediate state. Everybody in heaven right now is in the intermediate state, and you're in the ultimate location. And you and I have been sent as the advance team to get the ultimate location to look like the intermediate state, so the intermediate state can be delivered from its waiting, and that that is going on in heaven can begin to happen on earth instead of you believing the ultimate is die and go to heaven. The ultimate is for the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. The ultimate is for the knowledge of the glory of the Lord to cover the earth as the waters do cover the sea. The ultimate is let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, 822, 822, let's go. So now let's go back to Romans 8, verse 1. We did 17 through 21 where we're talking about creation. Let me give you a couple of notes on that as we, let's see here. The key to everything from environmental reforms to seeing the end of the tragedy of war is not a people who simply understand the doctrine of adoption and believe in their theoretical sonship, but rather the key is a people who are so convinced that they are beloved that as a result they enter into a measure of union that manifests something far more significant than the doctrine of sonship but actually releases the inheritance of likeness. Not just conceptually believing we are sons, but actually looking just like our eldest brother. Yeshua, who is, after all, the exact image of the Father. From here, listen to this, the groaning creation awakens to her glorious intention. You and I becoming glorious is about so much more than great church services with altered filled with people who want to go to heaven when they die. No, no, no. We have had it all wrong. We are not escaping to glory. We are being invited to become glorious here and now. 
And you and I, finally and fully entering into our glorious status as sons and daughters, will indeed set creation free. And from that sacred, and thus far anyway, elusive state that I am terming likeness and indeed oneness, everything, and yes, I mean everything, is changing. So, and this is fun. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. So now the case is closed. Matter of fact, I'm going to back up and give you verse 25 of Romans 7. No, verse 24. What an agonizing situation I am in. So who has the power to rescue this miserable man from the unwelcome intruder of sin and death? I give all my thanks to God for his mighty power has finally provided a way out through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. So if left to myself, the flesh is aligned with the law of sin. But now my renewed mind is fixed on and submitted to God's righteous principles. So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. For the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. Yet God sent his son in human form to identify with human weakness, clothed with humanity. God's son gave his body to be the sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and power of sin. So now... Every righteous requirement of the law can be filled through the anointed what can be fulfilled through the anointing one living his life in us. And we are free to live, listen to this, not according to our flesh, but by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Those who are motivated by the flesh only pursue what benefits themselves. But those who live by the impulses of the Holy Spirit are motivated to pursue spiritual realities. Oh, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set controlled by the spirit finds life and peace. In fact, the mind set focused on the flesh fights God's plan and refuses to submit to its direction because it cannot for no matter how hard they try. God finds no pleasure with those who are controlled by the flesh. But when the spirit of Christ empowers your life, you are not dominated by the flesh, but by the spirit. So to understand glorification you'll have to understand spirit domination. So just leave those verses up there if you don't mind, that verse up there. When the spirit of Christ, there you go. But when the spirit of Christ empowers your life, you are not dominated by the flesh, but by the spirit. But by the spirit. Now, what is the contrast? He wants to compare and contrast what it was like when your life was dominated by the desires of your flesh. Anybody remember what that was like? Didn't feel like you had a whole lot of choice. If you suffered with addiction, you certainly understand what I mean. You suffered with anxiety, depression, suicide, you certainly understand what I mean. Struggled with lust, pride, greed, fear, you certainly know what I mean. And that is limited because it's an expression born out of a realm in which Yahweh does not rule. But the spirit life is an expression born out of the realm where Yahweh rules. Therefore, the individual controlled by the spirit should be more out of control than anybody in this room ever was when they were controlled by the flesh. I'm not talking about making good decisions and being an awesome American Christian. I'm talking about being possessed by the Spirit. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm not talking about memorizing some Bible verses. I think you should memorize Bible verses. I memorize Bible verses. It's good to memorize Bible verses. But this is a dead letter without the Spirit. I know this because I sit under numerous theological professors. That did not have the life of the Spirit in them, but knew more about this book than you could ever imagine. Were experts on this book and had no idea what it meant to live according to the impulses of the Spirit. We're moving towards an authority that cannot be safely inherited without being under the full rule and control of the Spirit. And I'm afraid of anywhere where they're preaching to people about their authority and not talking to them about being possessed by the Spirit. 
because it's literally the Spirit ruling through you, not ruling like you want to and asking the Spirit to bless it. This is the political crap we're in right now. The mess the church is in where we are losing more of our validity by the day by pondering around in politics because we are trying to say this is what we want and we can talk God into blessing it. And the man who is under the control of the spirit doesn't have to talk God into anything. Everywhere the sole of his foot treads, that ground has been given unto him and everything he sets his hand. I'm going to I'm gonna say some things tonight. Everything he sets his hand to prospers and you and I are being invited to quit playing around with trying to get God to authorize our ideas about how we think things should go because we're Christians and we all think the same way and God's looking for a people to think a way nobody's ever thought before because they are a people who are thinking with a renewed mind. People being renewed in the spirit of their mind. People who are being able to say, you know what, I believe I have authority from right here in these woods in Theodore in this metal building. I believe what we say matters. Why? Because we are a group of people who have found more than a good Bible-believing church to attend once a week. We are a people who have said yes to the Holy Spirit, infusing us in such a way that our lives become a living, breathing witness of what it looks like to be under the control of the Spirit. And some Democrats are going to find their way there too. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Paul is addressing more than our human sin and not at all our fear of burning forever in hell. He's addressing way more than this. Paul is giving us the keys to just how a man, I want you to listen to this, in the state of internal chaos can be liberated and how in turn one such liberated man will be so glorious in the earth as a human being that that man will indeed settle the chaotic cosmos into her pre-intended glory and rest. But you have to become glorious first. You're not waiting on creation around you to settle down and you join in. The closer you and I get to the status we were called to, the more creation should be groaning. And when you hear that, you begin to say, the groan of creation is close. And in, since coming here and, and transitioning here, all of a sudden we are now beginning to see the visible evidence of the settling of the cosmos. The last year Tammy and I lived in this area, we evacuated three times and should have evacuated four. I have not watched a storm in the last two years, not watched one. The crime rate in Mobile, remember the numbers I gave you? 51 murders first year, 41 murders the second year, 31 murders last year. It's getting worse out there, not here. I'm not, I, don't, I don't do that math. 51 murders. It's hilarious. It falls exactly by 10. 51 murders, then 41 murders, then 31 murders. We're not far from no murders. We just celebrated St. Patrick's Day. Good old St. Patrick. Let the Irish people say hallelujah. Have a pint. So... So we just celebrated St. Patrick's Day. Now, history is not the Bible. St. Patrick was way after the Bible. But there's stuff that's also true that's not the Bible. I know. I know. It's shocking to you. And, and it's been recorded that in the seven years in which St. Patrick was most inflamed with the love of God that crime completely ceased in his homeland. Wasn't that there weren't evil people. It's that they weren't permitted to do evil because one man had changed the atmosphere of the region. <laughs> What's beginning to happen as a group of people begin to give their life to a contemplative lifestyle of engaging with and being led by the Spirit to the point that you and I are beginning to look to the cosmos that's saying, I, I'm going to tell you something, Paul envisioned this happening quickly, which means he underestimated religion. This would have happened a long time ago had religion not gotten her hands on Romans. 
And that's why I said, and I say it boldly, how religion almost ruined Romans. We're recapturing now and understanding that this is a letter about people being co-glorified because they've accepted the sufferings of Christ as their own. And because there's no condemnation, they can now begin to live the life of the Spirit they were designed for. And as they live the life of the Spirit, they are unveiled as sons because sons live, moved by the impulses of the Spirit. And as that unveiling takes place, what is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is creation goes, finally, we haven't had anybody to tell us what to do since Adam. We're just looking for instruction. So let's take a little jump back now and let's talk a little bit of theosis. Okay? Let me give you a few quotes about what the early church believed the salvific expression was, or the soteriology. The salvific expression to the early church meant this. You ready? St. Irenaeus in Against the Heresies. Great book, by the way. Christ, by his own love, became what we are in order to perfect us to be what he himself is. That's the spiritual grandson of the Apostle John. Irenaeus has a spiritual son named Polycarp. I mean, I'm sorry. John has a spiritual son named Polycarp. Polycarp has a spiritual son named Irenaeus. He didn't have a Bible. He didn't have a New Testament. But he had the witness of a man who had laid his head on the breast of Yeshua. And he did not believe that man simply came to keep people from going to hell when they died. He believed that measure of love was to perfect us for us to be as he himself is. I didn't come up with this. But I'm going to fight against the loss of it. Because if this whole thing is about us not dying and going to hell, let's go to Whataburger right now. We got that. And eat a bunch of it because the quicker you die, the better it is, right? Because this is all going to hell anyway. We're supposed to die and go to heaven. So let's just, you know, I mean, that's what the Pentecostals have been eating themselves to death for years. Go to hell if they had a glass of wine, but my God, they triple trip around a buffet and never sin. It's amazing. It's amazing. Cut them in gravy, come out their leg, but they ain't going. They ain't going to drink no wine. By God's sake, that wine's of the devil. All right, Jesus made great juice. Okay, all right, I got to move on. Saint Athanasius, on his great work on the incarnation of the Word of God, is one of my all-time favorite books. Saint Athanasius on the incarnation of the Word of God says, who was also a spiritual son of Irenaeus, by the way, St. Athanasius says on his, in his book on the incarnation of the Word of God, for he was made man that we might be made God. Say that now. In the heresy, you can't say that. But Athanasius could. It really doesn't matter to me if somebody on Daystar does. There's so many thoughts going through my mind right now that I'm not saying... You should be so proud of me. <laughs> I, need, I deserve a hug. All right, right? He was made man that we might be made God. St. Gregory of Nazianzus, who coined the term theosis, said God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and nothing else is God in the same way. And this is important. When we say becoming God-like, we're not saying become God because nothing else is God in the way that God is God because God did not become anything. He's uncreated. That powerful? So nothing else is God in the same way the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God. Neither the Father, Son, and the Spirit was made God, nor did they become God. There was no process of divinization. In the orthodox doctrine of theosis, it's always a creature who doesn't cease being a creature who comes to share in the life of the divine. So what we're talking about is we're not talking about like the Mormon doctrine of you becoming God and then one day you're given your own planet and you rule over the whole planet. What's the point of that? There's nobody on the planet anyway. I never have understood that. But anyway, what I am, I'm talking about your very humanness being infused through union with the life and fellowship of God until it affects your nature. And you begin to become like God, not just in legal standing. You become, listen to this, like God in functional nature. You were predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. And many of us had to be deconformed 
in order to be reconformed so that we could begin to understand the fullness of why it is that you and I have longed for more. Why have we wanted more? Why has enough not been enough? Why, why did you sit in a church and look around and seem like everybody else seemed like to be perfectly fine with everything? And you're like, for real? And we had to come up with stuff like people going to glory. And God needed another angel first choir. And, and all the stuff that we have said God did that was bad, we just had to say it wasn't bad because God did it. It'd be bad if you did it, but it's not bad if God did it. No, bad is bad. And if it's bad for me to do it, it's certainly bad for God to do it. She's saying, don't do it. Why? I, you don't even know what I'm going to say, but you just know me. I'm smiling. So. If God told you right now to go out and murder everybody of a particular ethnicity, including all the women and children, would you do it? You better say no, by the way. I'll kick you out of this church. But you applaud people who did it one time. And act like it was God's idea. No, <laughs> I want you to go right now and, I'll go and, and you'll find a bunch of Muslims and I want you to murder all their little children. There's not a person in here that would do it. Why? Because the Bible tells you not to. The Bible told them, the head of the Bible told them not to kill too. But you can, get, you can justify any of your wicked desires. If you can make it God's idea. How much wickedness have we participated in in the name of religion? Matter of fact, how many wars would we have never had if there was not a religious undertone to the war? How many crusades would have been avoided if somebody did not believe their cause was righteous enough for them to go wipe out and annihilate an entire people group? Ask the American Indians how that feels. How about this? Next time you play cowboys and Indians, be the Indian. Rut row. Right? So, so what's happening is there has to be a shift in consciousness about what good is and what evil is and that God can't be evil. And this is what John meant when he said he is light and in him is no darkness whatsoever. We've got to shift our consciousness and our thinking regarding what God is like to understand. The, 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 the Hebrew fathers were wrestling with an understanding of who God is. They didn't have it right. They weren't supposed to. Jesus was the one who had it right and Jesus is the one who came to show us what the father is like and you cannot try to balance what Moses believed about the father and what Jesus believed yes. about the father John said no man has seen the father at any time except the beloved son who came forth from his bosom that takes every theophany and puts it over here in a different category and says you don't have to get Jesus to bow to the theophany you have to get the theophany to bow to Jesus all right, I got, I'm off. That wasn't too bad, was it? All right, checking with mama. Got to go home with mama. All right, I'm going to read you a couple more and we'll go home, okay? St. Augustine of Hippo, the North African doctor, I think he died in about 430. Um, I want you to listen to what he said. He said, we carry, my God, this is powerful, mortality about with us. We endure inf infirmity. We look forward to divinity. For God wishes not only to vivify us, but also to deify us. When would human infirmity ever have dared hope for this unless divine truth had promised it? St. Catherine of Siena, the Dominican doctor of the church, love transforms one into what one loves. When asked to define the coming shining ones, she said, I have given, my God. I have given the soul by creating the soul in my image and likeness the ability to become who they are. Who are they? They are another me, for they have lost and drowned their own will. And united 
themselves and clothed themselves and conformed themselves with me. They are indeed another me. In your nature, eternal Godhead, I shall come to know my own nature. And what is my nature? Boundless love. It is fire because you are nothing but a fire of love. And you have given humankind a share in this nature. For by the fire of love you created us. Religion may say that you can share in the fellowship of Jesus, but will never say that you can share in the fruit of what that fellowship was designed to produce. Religion will applaud you all day long for celebrating the presence of God, but religion will always balk at the idea of you becoming like the one you have beheld. Always. I feel like tonight is sort of a, a roux. We're making gumbo. And there's a little theosis in here, right? And there's a little governing the new creation revelation in here that we need to get a little reform of our soteriology, understanding the soteria, the, the idea that we've been saved. And this is, what, this is how I want to di differentiate it, and we'll, we'll start to change here, we'll start to shift. When I say soteria or soteriology or saved or even sozo, saved or salvation, what I want to communicate to people is that that term should never have a forensic implication. It's not a legal term. It's a relational revelation. He didn't save you from a distance with a notepad in his hand. He saved you with scars in them. He wasn't going guilty, guilty, not guilty, guilty, not guilty, 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 and expect your believing to determine which one of those you fell into, the, which one of those determined what category you fell into. He saved the world. And it's our idea to let them know that. It's our, call, it's our design to let them know that, not our idea. It's our call to let them know the fullness of what has already been accomplished with or without their believing. The problem is, without believing in it, you never get to enjoy the beauty of it. But you believing in it doesn't make it happen. God is not your enemy on one side of your believing and your father on the other side. This is where I get in trouble. Because everybody wants to make God who he is based on their believing. Because they act like God changed when Adam fell. God is not generous and kind and benevolent and loving on one side of the fall of Adam and mean and vengeful and filled with wrath on the other side of the fall of Adam. It wasn't God that changed at the fall. It was Adam that changed at the fall. And Jesus did not come to change the Father's mind about you. Jesus came to change your mind about the Father. Yes. Whatever you think the father thinks about you, I'm here to help the adulterer understand that is not how my father thinks about you. And I'm here to help the leper understand that's not how my father thinks about you. And I'm here to tell the person who's been divorced five times, the father doesn't feel about you the way that you feel about yourself. It doesn't matter your backstory. It doesn't matter your history. And if you start to believe Jesus is the son of God, it'll do nothing to change Jesus or the father God, but it'll do everything to change you and you being changed is the first step to entering into theosis so that you can become the light of the world. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. I believe because of grace. I don't have grace because I believed. Even my believing was a gift that I can't take credit for because you don't know how thick the blinders were. <laughs> You don't know how thick the blinders were. If I see what I see today, it's not because it's what I deserve to see or it's because it's what I've sought to see. It's because what he and goodness chose to do by ripping the blinders off of my eyes and saying, I'm going to show you who I really am, even if you fight against it. God would come and sup and dine with me and have conversations with me in the center of my legalism. He didn't stay away and wait until I'd gotten my doctrine right before he engaged with me. He engaged with me until my doctrine was forced to evolve into my encounters. Oh. 
feel the weight of the glory of the Lord in this room. Lord, I just, I want to walk by the Spirit. I want to walk by the Spirit. Since I was a little boy, I wanted to walk by the Spirit. I wanted to walk by the Spirit. I want to know what it means to be a son. And I don't want it to be a theory. And for God's sake, I don't want it to be a doctrine. I want to be a son and I want it to be a relationship. I want it to be a relationship of fellowship until I, by way of encounter and fusion, begin to be once and for all conformed into the image of the one in whose likeness I was pre-designed to bear. Thank you, Father, for what I feel in this room tonight. I've never felt so close. I've never felt so close. I've never felt so close to the fusion of two worlds. I've never felt so close to being able to not really discern if I'm on this side or that side. Because maybe the end of this is there is no side. After all, the end of the book is not about us dying and going to heaven. It's about a new Jerusalem coming and tabernacling with us. I heard a voice on the Lord's day. He said, come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. And I looked, and there before me was a bride prepared and adorned for her husband. And I heard the voice of the Lord say, the tabernacle of God shall dwell with man. He will be their God, and they shall be his people. I'm telling you, he is tabernacling among us, homestead family. He's tabernacling among us, cosmic homestead family. And he's beginning to draw leaders together from all over the country, young and old. And we are beginning to revision the gospel. And the result of that is people who are disenfranchised with religion, but who at one time had a deep love for God, are going to be drawn back in. And you and I, by the grace of our own stories, are going to assist the Holy Spirit in untethering them from the whipping post of religion. And instead of them feeling like they've got to earn their way in and climb their way up, they're going to realize they were included by grace alone. And there's absolutely nothing they can do to stop his love from conquering every inferior desire in their hearts. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place tonight. He's going to have you, and he's going to have your children. He's going to have your children's children, and he's not going to have them delivered from hell and given a free ticket into heaven. He's going to have them co-glorified. He's going to have them operating in the very same glory that he operated in, and we are going to see the sick get healed, and we are going to see the dead be raised, and we are going to see kingdoms begin to come and search for the wisdom given to the sons. I stand as a Solomon asking Sheba to come learn of the more excellent way. For the queen of Sheba says the half has not yet been told of what she saw in the glory and the splendor of the kingdom of Solomon. Who is Solomon? The son of the beloved. And if one generation will become the beloved, the next generation will rule in peace and wisdom and prosperity all the days of their life. You and I are becoming David so that our sons can rule in Solomon's peace. Go, go, jump up there real quick, guys. Just pray in the spirit while they're getting there. Something moving in the room tonight. Something unusual moving in this room tonight. If I can become David, my sons can rule like Solomon. If I can step into my beloved identity, all my sons will ever know is peace. All they'll ever know is increase. All they'll ever know is opulent glory. For I declare the sons are coming after us to build that that houses the glory of God. And we will stand in our elder days and we will look at our sons and we'll say it was all worth it. Everything we walked away from, every judgment we faced, every criticism we had to endure, it was all worth it so we could stand today and say yes indeed. The suns are rising in the earth. All of creation is coming out of her chaos. The victory you and I were designed for is being inherited. Come on, engage with me. Engage with me tonight. You're not an outcast. Oh, la ba 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 
Come on, pray with me in the Spirit. We're going to live the life of the Spirit. We're going to have to speak the language of the Spirit. Pray with the Spirit. Pray with the understanding. If you want to move around the room, move around the room. If you want to come to the altar, come to the altar. If you want to pace the aisle, do whatever you feel like you need to do. But we're going to live by the Spirit tonight. Come, Paracletos. Oh, rule through the sons of Almighty Yahweh.
we're certainly not going to attempt to do any kind of formal dismissal tonight. But whenever you need to slip out, we understand you can go. Please do that quietly. And then like we do quite often, let's leave this room set aside for these that are having encounters. What I mean when I say that is no socializing in here. If you're, if you're here and you're engaging, great. We want you to remain, but we don't want anybody to be interrupted. Uh, they're ha having these incredible encounters with the Lord. So you can visit in the foyer. You can step outside and visit in the park area. But please keep this room set aside for this. Father, we thank you that all of heaven and earth stand at attention tonight. The great I am standing on behalf of this night and this exchange, this declaration. We've stepped into waters we've only dreamed of. And we know we're just getting started. We bless you tonight, Father. We honor you in the awesome name of Yeshua. In the awesome. Do we have prayer Monday? No prayer Monday. So we'll be back Tuesday night for Under the Oaks. We love you. We bless you.